Good evening, everyone. Um, I am going to uh, share my PowerPoint and we'll get started. Let me um, just do this for a minute. Um, and then I, I wanna um, talk to you. Let me see what I can do here. Um, about trying to minimize this, about the, um, the way I've organized this tonight. So I wanted to talk about the emotional system um, because it is central to understanding Bowen theory. <clears throat> it, Bowen theory is a natural systems theory. Um, so the way I've organized this presentation tonight is to talk about the emotional system in the nat natural world, and then to take discussion and questions, comments, um, and then to have a part two will be the emotional system in a family. And this is a family I researched over time during COVID and um, found um, some really interesting dimensions of this particular family. I want to minimize the, um, the uh, windows. How do I do that? I'm having, Ellen, can you help me? Yes, and if you see, there should be um, some small squares at the top of the, the oh, I had, it was It was hidden, thank you, I got it. Okay, so let's get going and um, we hopefully will have a good discussion. So Bowen theory um, is best known for its eight concepts, which I've listed here. Um, the, it, that is the um, backbone of Bowen's ideas about the family uh, functioning. Uh, it is moderated by two variables, differentiation of self and level of anxiety in the family. And this, I believe, is um, the best known framework in the world for understanding Bowen theory. But what I wanted to talk about tonight was the emotional system. And I, I believe that the eight concepts are kind of um, the waves on top of the emotional functioning of the C of the family emotional system. Uh, and the emotional system, and this is the foundation of Bowen's idea of a natural systems theory. And I think this is less understood and less well known. The emotional system in the family would be a natural outgrowth of the emotional system as it's evidenced in the natural world. And I wanna talk about that tonight. So I think Dr. Kerr, Dr. Michael Kerr in um, Family Evaluation uh, really summarizes the emotional system well. And I'm going to read it just to not go through it quickly. Uh, defined broadly, the concept postulates the existence of a naturally occurring system in all forms of life that enables an organism to receive information both from within itself, that is through the senses, and from the environment, um, which would include relationships, but also danger, to integrate that information and to respond on the basis of it. The emotional system includes mechanisms such as those involved in finding and obtaining food, reproducing, fleeing enemies, rearing young, and other aspects of social relationships. It includes responses that range from the most automatic instinctual ones to those that contain a mix of automatic and learned elements. And this um, would be theoretically throughout the tree of life that even in bacteria and um, eukarata, they, 
the organisms organized to procreate and defend themselves and to relate to one another. Um, and that we, um, we have um, inherited, we have, we have, our emotional system is built on this evolutionary um, uh, heredity from all of these different forms of life. So the emotional system has these adaptive capacities in every system. It, it varies according to the system, but the, they um, reproduce, the, it includes communication, uh, defense from predators, and providing for and sustaining the group. And there are variations in different species as to how these conditions are um, carried out, but the system as a whole would, um, would function to pr produce these capacities, the system as a whole. And one of the important aspects of this is that there is variation among different units as to their capability to uh, fulfill these functions. Um, and that is also a, a basic premise in Bowen theory that the human family uh, varies among um, different families as to how much they are able to um, address the challenges they face. So what I'm gonna to do tonight is I'm going to explore the emotional system in three species that are very different, honeybees, trees, and chimpanzees. And you may think this has nothing to do with humans or with the human family. Um, but I think as we talk, and if one has this conceptual framework of the family system, um, the emotional system, um, there are so many um, parallels in between, between the different uh, species, including the human. So um, one of the important things is to talk about the co-regulation of the individual in the relationship species, and it varies about how that's done um, in each species, um, and to identify how the variation in the functioning of the individual relationship system affects the adaptive outcome of the unit and its evolutionary success. So in, um, in each species, the behavior in the behavior of the bee, of the tree and the chimpanzee, um, there is self-regulation. That is the individual entity or individual um, has to survive. The tree has to grow. The bee has to do what it's, what it's going to do. The chimpanzee regulates itself within the um, troop, but it is also co-regulated in the system of which they are a part. Uh, so it is a, a reciprocal process of, of individual regulation and also being uh, regulated by the, by the group. So Thomas Seeley is, he was a, um, a, a speaker at one of our symposium, a distinguished guest lecture. And he wrote this book, he, he's a, um, a scientist at um, Cornell and he wrote The Honeybee Dem Democracy. And his research included um, very intricate um, designs where he numbered and identified the individual bees by color and number. Um, and uh, then he observed the activity of the bee. And you know, one, one thinks of the honeycomb and the hive as a group of very interrelated 
um, individuals? You know, what do they do that is um, self-propelled and self-regulated? Well, it turns out, according to um, Seely, that individual bees play quite an important role in the, in the survival and the life of the hive. So these individual bees go out into the environment and search individually for um, a new habitat for the swarm, uh, which is an essential part of how the bee colony functions. They come back and the individual bees dance in, in a certain configuration, telling the other bees how big the habitat they found or the, the nesting box they found, where it is um, and other, how far off the ground it is and other aspects which would inform the other bees um, what might be possible um, sites for them to nest. So each individual is self-regulated. The bee has to go out, has to do these measurements, it has to explore a certain habitat, and it has to come back and communicate um, to the swarm. So the, the survival of the swarm, and this is a picture of a swarm, has to do with how these individual bees communicate with the other bees. And it has to be, uh, I mean, that's honeybee democracy, that which he wrote. It has to be a consensus of the hive that the group um, moves and where they move to. Now, sometimes this is not the, the bee who the, the, the other bees listen to does not communicate a good option. And that affects the survival of the swarm. Um, one of the things that Seeley said is that the bees cannot really disagree because the queen has to go with one or the other. And if the, the hive or the swarm divides, it rarely survives. So this individual um, togetherness, um, reciprocity is an important aspect of the survival of the bee. And um, there's a variation in how successful bees are um, in integrating the individuality of the bee to, the, um, to communicate and to um, lead the other bees to a um, appropriate nest site. The second scientist I want to talk about is Suzanne Samard, and she's made quite a impact on the world of forestry in the last probably eight or 10 years. She, um, as with Seely, uh, was curious and interested in how the forest worked. So she just explored the interconnections among various species of trees with very intricate and interesting. She wrote the mother tree, finding the mother tree, um, which you might be interested in reading. Um, and what she found is that uh, in spite of the um, views of foresters that land should be cleared and um, trees should be planted in uh, specific rows that gave them room to grow without the competition of other trees, that she, she discovered that trees communicate and offer resources to one another in a complex system of forest ecology. So she says, well, the thinking was clear, get rid of the competition. Um, once the light, water, and nutrients were freed up by obliterating the native plants, the, um, the planted trees would, um, would thrive. 
But she found that the mother tree grows in a complex in a relationship with her offspring and other species in the forest. She discovered that the mother tree does not, keep, does not compete with, its, um, with a, its offspring or the younger saplings. It actually contributes to their growth. So this idea that all of these trees in the forest are in competition is, is incorrect according to her research. They um, actually aid one another. So what she discovered was that carbon, um, she at first studied the birch, how the birch trees and the fir trees um, were in an interactive symbiosis, um, that they traded um, different, um, they traded carbon in different seasons um, and that they were in a sophisticated exchange pattern uh, reaching a balance over the course of the year. So that a certain time of year when one was growing in a, in a particular way, they would receive more resources and in the other season where they were um, beginning to uh, slow down, they would transfer these resources to the other species. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. And so these are, it, it, she talks about, it's done through rhizomes in the root, um, in the roots of the trees. Um, and as she continued her research, she found all kinds of other intricate patterns that went um, into the interconnected web of the system of the forest. So th this conceptually would be equivalent to an emotional system in which the trees are nurturing the young. Um, they are defending against pest and they are sustaining the members of their community. And here is a um, diagram of um, the, the interconnections of the different species and the different um, sizes of the trees that were, getting, that were giving and receiving resources from one another. So that this was a complex web of relationships, not individual trees competing with one another. Um, I mean, I, I just think it's fascinating. So the last scientist I want to talk about is Jane Goodall. And I think all of you have heard of Jane Goodall. <laughs> one, of, um, one of her brilliant discoveries was to observe the chimpanzee in the wild. That was one of them. And, under, and begin to understand and um, observe, observe and begin to understand their relationship system. Um, and the other brilliant thing was that she stuck at this for 30 years and she identified troop relationship patterns over time. And of course the chimpanzee is the most related um, of these species. Um, so she talks about, this is almost a, a repeat of a, of a um, quote that Bowen wrote about the human family, um, that the, the child's capacity um, to function and to survive had to do with the disposition of the child's mother, his or her position in the family. For instance, um, the uh, infant was, was aided um, by having elder siblings uh, and their sex and personalities. Um, and that the stability of the family, of the family group um, was, was responsible for the ability of the child, of the uh, infant chimpanzee to survive over time. So she talks about Flo, uh, who was relaxed and friendly um, she got along with, with the other, the adult males in the, in the troop. Uh, she um, 
her and her daughter Fifi um, became a self-confident and assertive child. It is very interesting that um, as Flo um, became older, uh, she had a very um, fused relationship with her youngest um, offspring who did not do so well as um, this particular infant um, and died soon after Flo died. Uh, so there was a variation in Flo's competency, but it, um, good old contrast Flo with another chimpanzee um, named Passion. And Passion, I don't have a picture of Passion, um, but she was a loner. She didn't get along with the males in the troop. Uh, she didn't nurture her child. Um, the child was anxious and cleaning. Uh, clinging um, and was the child was very anxious um, within the troop. And they, Palm and Passion, um, for several years were um, carried out infanticide in the troop and you know, snatched babies from the mother, um, other mother chimpanzees, and killed and ate them. So this is the variation within um, a chimpanzee troop of an extremely competent mother um, who is relaxed in the relationship system and one who um, we would call anxious <laughs> in human terms, um, who is quite reactive um, and did not function well as uh, a mother. So this is a variation that can happen in, in a functioning troop. Um, that is, there, there's a differential uh, absorption of, of the troop anxiety, of the troop, of the, of the emotional process in the troop. And the emotional system in this troop um, allows for a variation in terms of individual capacity to um, contribute um, to the adaptive capacity of the troop in terms of nurturing the young and defending the providing resources and defending the troop. So each of these scientists, um, you know, explored and discovered living systems in nature um, by questioning assumptions and pursuing their research through observations. That is, they didn't come in assuming a particular thing, but they were interested in understanding how a sy system worked, how the relationship system among the individuals in a particular species and their environment, how they operated. And I think it came, they came to some remarkable conclusions. So I, I want to say um, one thing before we go to part two, and I want to take um, discussion now. So Bowen theory is not, it's not survival of the, of the fittest. It's, it's not the same thing as evolutionary theory. It is evolution-like, according to Bowen. That is, the, the history of the human family has a context, context in its many generations of survival. That in those, there's variation among the individuals and the units, which affects their adaptation and survival. And this tension between the individual functioning and the relationship process um, varies in terms of um, what is the process that best supports their adaptive success. And I will then get into um, 
what is unique about the human um, in this evolutionary process, um, which he believed, <coughs> excuse me, was the intellectual system and the capacity to make choices in the automaticity of the emotional system. Um, but before I go to part two, where I will talk about the human family, I want to take discussion and questions. So I'm going to stop share right now. And I'm going to ask what thoughts, questions, debates, <laughs> whatever. I am hoping this will um, stimulate thinking in the participants. Yes, Julia Scheidler. Mm. Thank you, doctor. This has been lovely. Um, my question uh, goes back to what you were saying about co-regulation. And with the different examples, especially with the chimpanzees, um, with, with better functioning and, and actually more harmful functioning within the group, how, how does the co-regulation is, for example, with the chimpanzees, work to uh, bring people like, I mean, chimps like passion um, out of the habit of infanticide, which is harmful for the whole troop, into maybe another way of dealing with anxiety or um, whatever impulses are, are urging her and, and Palm to, to kill members of their own troop. It doesn't seem like there's a a biological need for that, but nonetheless, they're, they're doing it. So how does the co-regulation in the group help to regulate that harmful behavior? Well, I mean, that's, that's what happened, is that the, um, the social structure of the troop um, began to mitigate that. Oh, behavior. can you say how they did that? Um, well, you know, the, 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 um, the relationship system among the females in a, in a chimpanzee troop is extraordinarily um, complex, but also mm -hmm. uh, strong. And there's a hierarchy mm -hmm. in, in a chimpanzee troop in terms of the, the alpha male, but also there's an alpha female. And the alpha female relies on the relationship with the alpha male to some degree, and the alpha male relies on the the relationship system of the females in the troop. You know, but it, it's the same question that we have in our human species. You know, what- so We what, might find people punish, those punishing and then those sort of regulating through nurturing. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of violence that, that we mm. experiencing, you know, and what is, the, what is the social regulation of that violence um, that does not promote adaptive functioning in the social group. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting, I think, you know, um, Goodall said for years and years, she saw these people, these chimpanzees, <laughs> keep making that mistake. These chimpanzees is, you know, friendly, gregarious souls until she, she came across the infancist side. Mm. And she, that was a real, I mean, she said, I had to wait around long enough for that to happen, that they have this brutal side, just like, and it, and it happens with, uh, between troops where they will hunt and kill mm -hmm. members of another troop. Um, but th this is what I think we're talking about. That is, it is the interplay of the individual and the way that it, the individual's behavior is regulated by the, by the social group. And then how the social group, uh, how the individual impacts the social group. Mm -hmm. so that it go, and what we're talking about in Bowen theory is the family, 
but I think we can extend the family to a wider framework mm -hmm. in human society. Um, but one of my points, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your question. I mean, one of my points is we can look at individual, what we would call pathology in the human family, but it may be adaptive in the, in the social system, mm -hmm. in the emotional system. It may not, it may be compensated in the emotional system of, of the species. Mm -hmm. um, so we can talk more about that with the human family. Um, okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Other thoughts, questions, ideas? Oh. I mean, I, I think it's a question. I mean, do you just think this is, makes total sense or does it seem far out for you to um, think about how the bees have a similar emotional system to the human, have, have similarities to the human? Kathleen Smith. Tell me if I'm wrong about this, Dr. McKnight, but one thing I remember about the bees that that um, Dr. Seely talked about was that they wouldn't make a choice based on what other, just on what the other bees communicated. They had to go and see for themselves before they could make a decision about <laughs> where they would go. Is that accurate? I just thought that individual component was always very interesting to me. Um, well, or is that not true? <laughs> I mean, I don't, the whole swarm doesn't go, but okay. they're, they, I, I mean, I guess there's a, you know, like a warrior bee or, but this is like a, like a real estate bee, <laughs> the bee that's looking for <laughs> the, the new house. And they will take some of the other bees that have this function to look at it. Uh, but it, that's not necessarily, I mean, it's the waggle dance that does you know, that, that convinces the um, majority of the bees that it's important to go in a certain place, which I, I just think is just fascinating. I mean, how, you know, how do you communicate a size, a height, uh, a location, where it is um, through, doing a waggle dance. <laughs> it's just so interesting. Well, are, are there any other thoughts, questions? Or this all seems obvious. I have a quick question. Uh, my name is uh, Moses Joshua. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. And uh, I am uh, new to the Bowen's uh, family system. And I'm looking at the question uh, or the comment you made, um, humans alone have the capacity to reason. And I'm just trying to uh, take that uh, Bowen's theory uh, concept to see, is that uh, the capacity to reason um, is the capacity from the human intelligence point of view, where does bees, trees, and chimpanzees have their own capacity to reason in their own frame of environment and ecology? Could you make any comments on that? Um, if you will raise your hand, you will be highlighted so I can see who you are. Do you know how to raise, raise your hand? I'm trying to uh, figure that out. It's on the bottom of your, um... yes, thank you. Um, and we will just also need you to turn the video on in order to highlight. Uh, 
I'm in a, a public system, so I cannot uh, turn the uh, camera on, sorry. Okay. Um, Mr. Moses, could you just repeat your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just going with the comment you made about um, humans alone have the capacity to reason. That's one of the uh, Bowen's uh, theories concept, I suppose. I am looking at it from the, my question is uh, the capacity to reason differentiates for the bees, for the chimpanzees and the trees in their own ecology. So uh, could you make some comments on how humans alone have the capacity to reason and the others uh, don't in their reasoning? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> because I was thinking about that today, you know, that I took out a part about this um, that was described by Franz de Waal, who had, who also works with chimpanzees, who talked about um, this chimpanzee he had known over the years in Arnheim, where he worked originally. He now is at Emory. And um, he talked about how she, how this chimpanzee was so um, capable of sensing emotion, responding, um, navigating different relationship systems, the humans as well as um, the other chimpanzees. And, and you think about exactly how is that different or in what way does that, is that different than the human? And I, I think, uh, I'll get into this more in the second part uh, about the human family, but one of Bowen's basic foundational um, centerpieces of his theory is differentiation of self. And one of the things I think he wanted to address with the emotional system was how much we are affected by the automatic things we don't see, you know, that our reactions to some degree are formed in the family unit and we repeat them with our children. However, there is an aspect that the human or the uh, capacity that the human has to set um, goals for a life course, to think through the ethical dimensions of one's life, the meaning of one's life, how one wants to conduct one's life that can engage this automatic side. You know, our reactivity, our, the way we, um, we relate to the people who are important to us, a lot of that, I think, if you study human families, is pretty automatic. But we also have this capacity to chart a course um, where you're working against what's automatic. You know, whatever, whether you don't like what you do or whether you want to be, um, you want to achieve a certain place in life or whether you want to manage yourself differently than, than you were used to, that that takes decision-making, planning, reasoning, and goal setting that is not really available to any other species. Do you have, do you wanna say anything in response to that? I'm thinking just like you and just trying to uh, see uh, the whole uh, ecology and the human, family systems, they, I mean, uh, even though there is similarities and connection, we are all intelligence in our own ecology, in our own systems. So I was just trying to, uh, <laughs> uh, trying to uh, uh, reason that comment, humans alone have the capacity to reason. Well, I, I will go on and talk about the human family, um, but I, I think that it isn't that, um, that other species don't have um, 
ways of navigating their environment where they make choices. I mean, that's the case. They have emotion, they have, um, they have certain choices, but the automatic is the, the instinctual, or, um, the, the instinctual processes in most animal species, I think drive the way the species is organized and how, and I mean, it's for over the, the course of their evolution for their survival. So is there, is there anybody else? I mean, thank you for your question. I mean, these are the kinds of questions that I think are useful for the audience. Any other thoughts? Okay, well, I will go on and then we can take discussion about the, um, the second part. So let me share my screen. So in part two, I wanna talk about the emotional system of the human family. Um, I, I thought it was important to present the different species because I think one of the things that we minimize in the human family is the automatic nature of the, of the reciprocity in the relationship system. How, how much, I mean, I don't know if anybody just went home for Christmas, but I, I mean, for Thanksgiving, but I did. And I could, I could see how automatic old patterns emerge, automatically old patterns emerge, even though I'm pretty aware of them and I've worked to manage myself in them. Um, but it is this undercurrent of connections that are highlighted by particular patterns and intensity um, that I think characterizes the human family. Um, so Bowen says, there are some basic assumptions about man and the nature of, emo of emotional illness, including the notion of an emotional system. Man is viewed as an, you know, you could say the human is viewed as an evolutionary assemblage of cells who have, has arrived at his or her present state from hundreds of millions of years of evolutionary adaptation and malad maladaptation and who is evolving onto other changes. In this sense, man is related to all living matter. And I, um, this, the circle, this is man here, I believe. Um, in, so Bowen, Bowen's ideas is often called Bowen theory, but Bowen actually called the theory a natural systems theory. That is to see the human as a part of all this evolutionary development um, and the way the organisms, the living organisms manage themselves to survive and reproduce um, was important in thinking about a scientific vision of human behavior. That is, this is much different than Freudian's idea, Freud's ideas, which were to some degree after, although he, he added so many dimensions to, to the thinking about the human psyche. Nevertheless, he had many um, ideas like the edible complex that weren't scientific, um, that came from philosophy or um, other areas of um, human knowledge. But Bowen wanted to ground his thinking in the biology of 
of life. So in a similar way, if you look at the emotional system of the human family, it also does, its function also is to raise and nurture the young, uh, to communicate and operate uh, together, uh, to, to defend the family from external challenges. And this, I think, has varied over the generations. Um, and to provide for and sustain the group. Um, and that, that this, this unit often has not been recognized for the importance that it plays in, um, in human behavior. I mean, people talk about communities and societies, but it is the family that operates to carry out these functions. So this is my extended family. The, um, the idea that I want to put across is the emotional system of the human family is adapted in managing the tension that, that exists between the individuals in the family. And that is a whole source of tension of how, how the family operates together and the tension between the individual and what the individual is uh, seeking to achieve in their own life and the, and the requirements of the family life um, that they need to um, up, adapt to. So this family um, has an interesting, um, is interesting across the generations. So I just want to emphasize that the, this, as the bees, the individuals strive for autonomy and self-regulation to sustain their own lives. Um, but that is also balanced with group, with loyalty to the family and co-regulation by the family. You know, I, I mean, I, I think Thanksgiving is such an interesting example for, for us Americans where how much do we seek to uh, replicate what we grew up with in terms of family traditions or do the opposite? Um, you know, in what way, when you think about a family getting together, um, does it operate in a particular way that is different from other families and that an individual learns how to regulate themselves, but also seeks some sense of autonomy um, within the family. Um, we often call it togetherness. So in Bowen theory, um, tension and anxiety within the family system is regulated through these four mechanisms. Um, distance, cutoff, conflict, over under functioning reciprocity and the family projection process. And I wanna talk about how this particular family utilize these mechanisms um, to manage themselves, to manage the anxiety in the family, but also while these mechanisms affected individuals in the family, they were adaptive for the family system. So we could talk about that in the questions. So this is um, George and Hannah. Um, they were born in the first part of the 19th century. Um, George was the sixth of 12 children. He was the son of a minister. And Hannah was the youngest of nine. And her father was also a minister. Um, but he died when she was four years old. So she um, kind of had a peripatetic life where her mother and her other siblings would go and live with various of the older siblings while she was growing up. Uh, so they 
went from one place to another. I mean, they were, I think, taken care of, but it was um, kind of a, a the life of a rolling stones, so to speak. So I, I, I just want to put this family in a context. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we, we think about family anxiety and the pandemic, family anxiety and the war in, um, in Ukraine. Um, but this family in there, when raising their children was during the civil war, leading up to the civil war and then during the civil war, uh, which in some of the family was in the South and fought for the South. And some of them lived in the North, most of them lived in the North and fought for the North. So that was a, um, a tension that operated in the larger family. They moved to a very small town and were pioneers. Um, they moved far from their family and um, ministers in those days had a level of poverty. And um, they had the, the death of a daughter um, and Hannah was an, um, father died early. So this family had three children, Mary, Thomas, and Will, and I want to talk. So in, in reading the letters about this and, and some of the material about this family, Hannah was thought of as a saint. You know, she was the head of the missionary society. George uh, started a, a church in this little town, which grew to be very large and uh, uh, important church in the, in, the, um, in the town. So they were ex extraordinarily respected and very much a part of the community. So I'm gonna talk about Mary first. Um, Mary, this is Mary later in life. Uh, she marries um, an uh, aspiring businessman uh, who ran away from his family, but we won't go into his life, um, and then was sent to the small town to um, live with his uncle so that he wouldn't, uh, he couldn't join the Civil War, the Union troops in the Civil War. So they marry. And this is Hannah, the saint, um, with two of the grandchildren, George and Jewel. And when she dies, Mary goes into a sudden decline. Uh, and she literally has years of chronic illness where she's hospitalized, she's into sanitarium, she sp spends a great deal of the year in the South trying to regain her health. Um, so theoretically, her attachment to her mother had a profound effect when her mother died. So she is chronically ill. So this is the um, over under functioning reciprocity between Ross and Mary. And there's many, many letters that talk about her illness and his effort to address it. And, and a lot of it has to do with sending her money, you know, in, you know, to live in the South, to um, take care of herself, to have a caretaker, um, because she had a pretty comprom compromised life. So this would be an example of one of Bowen's concepts of over under functioning reciprocity. They had four children, uh, George, uh, Mary, Jewel, and Ida. And um, as Mary's functioning declines, Jewel, this is Jewel as a teenager, she steps up and um, takes care of the younger daughters. And the, there's letters of the younger daughters um, talking about how much they miss their mother and they wish she would come home. And um, it was quite a difficulty for the, for the family that her illnesses. So I would, call this 
a projection process, a, a family projection process, which is part of another of the mechanisms to manage anxiety. That is rather than the mother taking care of the daughter or worrying about the daughter, the mother's anxiety falls on the daughter and the daughter's life is affected in terms of her taking responsibility in the family. Well, let me just go back. Um, Jewel was a, a absolutely gorgeous young woman, um, but she did not marry until she was 55. And she was, um, I, I will come to her, her uncle, her mother's brother, who she was a hostess for. Uh, so she was taking care of various members of the family um, to the point where she did not establish her own family. So the second child is Thomas. Um, and I have a lot of difficulty in finding information about Thomas. But I, in the COVID period, I was able to um, find his descendant who had been cut off from the family um, since her birth, um, you know, probably for the last 80 years. But here are these two very um, respected, very devoted to their church and community, but they, so this is my interpretation, but I think the evidence would be that they uh, focused on this boy as less than capable. Um, and um, there is very, very little information about him in the family. And I would call this a family projection process where he um, somehow struggled with the emotional intensity of the reactivity of his parents. This is the only picture I have of Thomas. Um, so the family projection process would be the parents focus worry on a child, what is beyond what is realistic for the child's welfare. And the child does not develop autonomy or separate successfully as an adult. So Thomas, cuts off, which is another mechanism to manage anxiety in the family. Um, and he, um, when he's 31 years old, he has two children. He moves to Hawaii to start a business. But as I think the family predicted, the business fails. Um, the family lived in poverty. His sons worked on the dock, like when they were nine and 10 years old. His wife sews for pin money, and he refuses to come home for his mother's funeral. Um, and they basically don't ever see him again. Um, cut off is a, you know, one of the distance or cut off is one of the mechanisms to handle anxiety um, in the family. What, what I had been told um, over the years was that Thomas was a missionary in Hawaii, but in, in researching it, that had, that was not actually the case. That was the way the family. Um, so we get to the youngest, I wanna have time for discussion, to the youngest um, whose name is Will. And Will was actually born after the death of this daughter at age one. Um, and Will was an entrepreneur. He was an enormous philanthropist in the area, in the place he came from. He was a US Senator. Um, Jewel, the daughter, uh, uh, Mary's daughter, uh, came and was his hostess in Washington, DC um, for a number of years. Um, however, Will was married um, when he was about 24. And he lived briefly with his wife, who was reported to have a nervous collapse in response to his over-involvement with his work. And this was in a newspaper article. 
where they explained this. <laughs> so this wasn't just the, this was not the family story. This was what was reported um, in the newspaper. So that, um, you know, conflict is another dimension of um, the management of anxiety in a family. However, Will over the years was very connected to his family and he was a huge resource to his sister's children. So he is here. Um, this is Mary, that little girl. And I believe this is Ida. Um, but he took, he took the sisters around the world. He was very um, devoted to his sister's children. And he played a role with his brother. Ultimately, he brought his brother um, back from uh, Hawaii and um, bought him a farm. The brother never returned back home, but bought him a farm in uh, California, an, an orange, orange producing farm. So he was to some degree a huge caretaker in this family. So what does differentiation look like in this family? You know, in what way were um, the individuals able to work together to adapt to the circumstances they faced? So this goes back um, to what um, the, the question was. So Bowen's point of view was that humans alone have the capacity for differentiation of self. Um, and the way he defines this, or I define it as understanding Bowen theory, is differentiation is about the capacity to manage emotion triggered in the interactive co-regulation of family members through thoughtful, reflective, principled behavior based in the intellectual system of the human prefrontal cortex. So that's a lot of big words, but that is the human does not have to do the automatic. Uh, they, the, they, it's difficult, but in regulating self-regulation in highly emotional circumstances where one might be reactive, um, the human is able to take principled positions and stands. And the ability to access intellect and reasoning um, is, is a human capacity to engage the challenges that are faced from the environment and within the unit. That is, do people manage themselves by being angry with one another or do they manage themselves by engaging in a way that problem solving can be um, best um, carried out? So this is a quote by Bowen um, and what he's basically saying is that each of us grow up with a certain level of maturity in a family. And that's determined by the maturity of our parents and the time we were born. You know, what made Thomas's life so different from Will's? Um, you know, what was he the oldest son and had huge expectations on his shoulders? Um, did Will come along in a way that Thomas had, you know, kind of um, cleared the, the path for him? Um, did, um, you, you know, did the, um, the death of um, Hannah affect the, the children differently uh, in terms of Will and Mary and Thomas? Um, so was there more tension at a certain point? 
So all of these things are um, create variation in the way a child is handled in the family and the, and the child's sensitivity to the emotions and um, the emotional climate of the family. So what I wanna end with is that although one might look at over under functioning, Mary's illnesses or Thomas's cutoff or um, you know, the, the pressure on Jewel to function uh, for her mother in a way that didn't allow her to have her own life and family um, or Will's marital conflict and separation. Each of those could be thought of as a dysfunction, but the adaptive capacity of this family was managed through these mechanisms. I hope we talk about this, that at one level seem like they create dysfunction, but at another level compensate for one another. For so these individuals varied in their functioning, but as an emotional unit or an emotional system, this family was very competent. The family reproduced. They secured substantial resources to sustain family members where they came from pretty, pretty restricted circumstances and they were able to make, uh, do well in life. Um, they were in, not Thomas, but they, the others were in communication to solve the problems they faced. Um, they were highly respected in their community and they sustained the family and a, a variety of other cousins um, that I haven't talked about kind of revolved around this family and um, connected with it. So you can look at these mechanisms as a way to manage the tension, but also they can be thought of as adaptive to the unit or the system. So we still have time for um, discussion, but the takeaway is the emotional system in the natural world is foundational to understanding that in the human family. And that, I mean, what's the purpose of this? One aspect is it, how much does thinking about the evolutionary and the multi-generational process in the family system help one to become more neutral about the present and about more neutral about clinical cases or neutral about the kinds of families one, one finds in congregation, more neutral about um, individuals in one's family that don't seem to be functioning in a way that makes one comfortable. Um, and in the course of this, um, how much does a person have an interest in working on differentiation or the capacity to engage this automatic emotional responsiveness that we all share? And sometimes it's hard to see it until one is trying to step back and observe it. So um, for me, you know, clearly this is my own family. Um, it, it was, it's been really useful to research and understand. I, I came out of this research with, with a, just a different view of how the pieces of this puzzle fit together. And, um, you know, to, for me, what it did is it sort of um, gave me perspective on the outcast, which is Thomas. And I got to know Thomas's 
granddaughter, who's now 82 years old. Um, and she gave me a lot of history of that family that I, no one knew. Um, and also um, the stars. Will, they called him Uncle Will, was a star. And uh, his marriage was really never talked about. He, he was just, um, you know, the senator and the philanthropist. So, you know, how much does looking at this multi-generational family system help one to gain perspective? So that's it, folks. And I, <laughs> I'm wondering if in the, with the human family, you'd have more, you have some ideas, questions, thoughts. Well, let me ask this question. Um, well, there's someone. Well, okay, well, I'll take uh, Stephanie Ferrara and then we'll. <laughs> one, of your, one of your latter points, uh, there were so many interesting points along the way. Uh, that's something I hadn't thought about before. When you look at a family, if you, it depends what what lens you want to use and, and whether you want to focus on the flaws or the failures or the symptom levels uh, or the number of uh, estrangements, and, you know, or do you want to look at the overall picture of what that family has, how that family has survived and adapted under changing conditions uh, and uh, the, that larger picture, that larger view, that, that when you looked at your, uh, they had top, what, what did Dr. Bone call that? The, the top of the stadium view, <laughs> you know, the bigger picture view where you see more players and more, of the system at work and the over the overall outcomes across generations the family did um, master a lot of difficult conditions and adapt and survive and keep reproducing <clears throat> and so the basic functions of reproduction and providing resources for the, the next generation. Those functions were, were done quite well. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like the family can afford a certain amount of, of um, dysfunction or it's, you know, you, the, care, the family can carry a load of dysfunction, you might say. <laughs> And still, uh, the longer term, on the bigger picture, come out looking uh, pretty uh, adaptive, pretty stable. Was you know, I I think uh, appreciated that you you made that distinction. <clears throat> I mean, it's one of the things I thought about as I was working on this. You know that you know our our mechanisms to manage anxiety are they. Do they create dysfunction or do they, mm -hmm. are they also adapt? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it's how many members of your family can you sacrifice in order to go, <laughs> to go forward? Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Any, any other thoughts? Um, well, um, I, I this is you know this whole question of how much of a, uh, how much can the I'm thinking a lot I'm dealing a lot now with um, older people and de people in decline and families that are really um, a challenge to provide uh, a, a lot of caretaking 
And I think about the ratio of how many people need care and how many people are available to give care. And our whole society seems to be moving toward a high percentage of people who need care. So, you know, and on the family level, how much um, can you carry? How, how many people can you compensate for who, who are not able to, uh, to reach a, a level of you know, self-sufficiency and care of themselves? I, I think about that a lot. Well, it was interesting because when, in later life, when Mary was so sick, they brought the daughter from Hawaii out to care for her. Mm -hmm. And the daughter in Hawaii had no prospects. You know, mm -hmm. I don't even think she went to school at a certain point. So, you know, they were taking a child that needed mm -hmm. some care and, uh, and brought it brought her you know, companion to her aunt. Yeah. yeah. So it's those are the kinds of things that I think are just interesting. Yeah. You know, it's mm -hmm. anyway. Um, yeah. Um thank you. Daniel Sherman. Uh, thank you, Dr. McKnight. I've I've seen uh, many of your presentations on the web with uh Dr. Martinez and the group and stuff. And I became fascinated with the theory and whatever. I guess my question is one of the, this, what you presented is kind of the basic stuff that I've read about it beforehand. My question is, where's this go? I mean, is, is, is the organization really working on creating better understanding about in this current society, the complexities, you know, COVID, m multiple wars. I mean, the, the society becomes more complex. Uh, how, how does this get out to the families in the form of education? You know what I mean? It's sort of like this model. We talk about individuals and how they grow and all that and in schools and, and in colleges, there are a lot of studies of behavior. But when you get down to the organism of the family, and my question is, where is this headed in terms of being able to benefit not just the, the academic, but the actual therapeutic clinical to kind of help us get through these this, this uh, evolution? Well, I mean, one of the functions of the Bowen Center is to um, promote the theory and expand the theory. Um, and many, I mean, we have many, many people in our training programs who are clergy or clinicians. Um, I, I don't know that we, the Bowen theory at this particular juncture is gonna change the world, but I do think that differentiation um, can make a difference in one's family and one's work setting and with one's clinical and organizational work. Um, but I don't know, I don't have an answer to what's gonna be, you know, where, what's gonna be the answer for the world. I think we work as hard as we know how to um, allow people to learn more about the theory, if they're interested. The, I mean, the one thing, and here, here's our director, <laughs> Randy Frost, I'm sure has some ideas about this. Um, but one of the things that I think is really hard about Bowen theory is that it's not easy to learn to manage self. It, differentiation is a hard road to, Oh, and I don't think everybody is interested. I mean, that's my viewpoint, you know, that is, but some people are, and I think it can make a difference in their lives. So that's the best I can do for the, the world. Thank you. Randy Frost. Yeah, thanks very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. McKnight, um, really, uh, I think, highlighted a lot of things, but for me, uh, what especially stood out was the reciprocity between the functioning of the individual in the larger group, cross species, and yet the way the larger group also regulates uh, the individuals. Um, and it's this back and forth reciprocity 
that uh, has variation to it in a species and um, can promote uh, adaptation when it's working better and less so when it's, when it's less functional. I was thinking in response to, I guess it was Daniel's question that this, the fact of this reciprocity, particularly in the human where we have a little more flexibility implies that if the individual can understand their part in patterns that aren't as adaptive as they might be for the larger group uh, and can work on it and successfully alter their contribution to less than uh, adaptive patterns, the group can function better. And then if the group can function better, the other members of the family can function better. But it's, um, as you were suggesting, it's, it's not a, a quick fix and um, it takes effort and understanding and motivation for an individual to really modify um, their part in a pattern and contribute to uh, the overall adaptation of the group. But that would, to me, represent the promise of Bowen theory that uh, to the extent people can learn about how it works, what they can do with themselves and take responsibility for that, it has the uh, potential to, to modify the larger group, both the family and even uh, community and, and larger. Well, thank you. I mean, I was just sitting here thinking, well, what if Mary had pulled up her functioning? You know, would Ross have made less money? <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just interesting. Uh, would Jewel have gotten married? Yeah. I mean, who, who knows? But, um, but it's an interesting. Um, I'm gonna take one more here, Julia Scheidler. Thank you. Um, the, the whole questioning of like overfunctioning and all of that. Um, and, and even you mentioned, you know, <laughs> sacrifices was reminding me of how, um, from like an evolutionary perspective, you listed with the human and also with the non human, the, the collective need uh, to nurture the young and to provide for and all of that which is definitely um, the case and, and it makes sense uh, as, as animals, um, how we've you know, been doing that <laughs> from the earliest yeah. forms of life and how essential that is. When you spoke about what's unique about the human um, and, and the mechanisms in the brain that allow for differentiation, uh, and choice and reflection on emotional triggers and all of that to occur. What came to me was um, the difficulty, I guess, with the fact that human beings carry over these needs um, from childhood into adulthood and, and need nurturance um, and, and need things that children need, but in different ways. And so, I think that one of the, the areas of connecting, I guess, um, evolutionary or bi biological systems with human systems is, is seeing how the adult has the needs for, for security, for safety, for attachment, for love, um, and all of these things, not like a child, but in an adult way. And then how, how does the, the emotional family system nurture then the adults or not? Because it seems that that is where some of the high levels of anxiety and some of the more quote unquote pathological dimensions come out is in, in these adults that are not um, finding their uh, an equilibrium between how to self-regulate and how to continue to get what they need from the family. So I, I don't know, but I, I find hope, for example, in um, a lot of the literature around emotional intelligence and 
a regulation of emotions. There seems to be a lot of interest um, among people to work on this, to have a little bit more mastery over their emotional triggers and a little bit more freedom to choose how they respond. But I, I find very little outside of family systems, from Bowens in particular, encouraging people to go back to their family of origin to work on it. So it seems like that's an area where there's a lot of silence in, in the mainstream society about the how, how to differentiate. It's not just about learning self-help skills, I think. I don't know what your comment is on that. Well, I, I think it goes back to, um, well, I mean, the one thing I think I'm clear about is that um, the opportunity to go back to one's family is very useful to understand how deeply embedded our reactivity is based mm -hmm. upon, I mean, that's what, you know, I'm a clinician. <laughs> <laughs> this week I have an earful on, you know, I went back and saw my family and this is what happened, you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, just to see the, um, how one is embedded in the original relationship system and how it operated, uh, I think gives us a way to understand what, what is wired inside of us and what plays out in our present and current lives, in our marriages or with children or friendships or at work. Um, so I think it is unfortunate that, that it is mostly in Bowen theory that that's the effort to, to learn to manage oneself with the intensity of the original attached relationship system. Um, yeah. Did you have anything else you wanted to say about that? Oh, well, I, I think I've said enough, but it, it just, I, I don't know, like Daniel's questions also struck me. I didn't learn about, you know, Bowen until I was in graduate school. So, but I have been interested for decades in, in learning how I can help myself d differentiate before I even knew the term, but really grow and, and mature in my family and outside it. Um, and, and it took, you know, a class in family therapy to come across it, so. <laughs> it's out there everywhere in some places. Well, I wanna thank all of you for coming tonight. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to present this. And um, I will turn it back over to Kathleen Smith. <laughs>